Hello and welcome back to The Journey. I'm your host for this week, Rachel Sielski. This is WCTV's only faith-based show here on campus. Today, I'm gonna to be sitting down and talking about the end of the semester and everyone's favorite time of year, Christmas. And I'm also gonna be joined by BMS major, Jason Polgar, and the university chaplain, Mr. Josh Sumter. And I'm gonna sit down with them and talk about the story of Jesus's birth and who was the real Saint Nicholas and some of the miracles he performed and so many exciting things that I can't wait for everybody to hear about. So sit back and relax, you're watching The Journey. Hello and welcome back to The Journey, WCTV's only faith-based show. I'm your host for this week, Rachel Sielski. We're getting towards the end of the semester and a very special time here in America, which is Christmas time. Today, I'm joined by Jason Polgar. And so, Jason, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. So I'm excited to ask you a couple questions and we're just going to dive into the first one. So who was the real St. Nicholas? Well, the real St. Nicholas was a bishop from the region of Asia Minor which uh, currently in present day, it's uh, modern day Turkey. And he was the bishop of the city of Myra. And uh, from a young age, his parents trained him in the Christian doctrines and in the Bible, um, but, they, but they died when he was young. And he decided to give the entirety of the inheritance he received to the poor, to the sick, to the needy, and to become a, a servant of Christ, um, all out, all dedicated in. And he suffered, uh, persecution for it during the reign of Diocletian and gets the distinction of being called a confessor, which is somebody who suffers for the faith but doesn't die for the faith. And he's really known for his goodwill towards children, towards sailors. He's the patron saint of those two groups and a really important figure in church history. Oh, I think that's amazing because, you know, we don't typically think of St. Nicholas, when we think of Christmas, we think of like Santa Claus and getting a lot of gifts, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So I think it's wonderful to really understand that part of it and think about, you know, the importance behind it and that, mm -hmm. you know, Santa Claus is St. Nicholas and that's the whole thing and that it's about the giving in the season, mm -hmm. like, you know what I'm yeah. saying? And I think that's a much better thing to think about. So uh, what are some of the miracles he did? Think? Well, he has so many miracles reported to him. I mean, the first one, it's not a miracle, but the most important story about him is that there were, uh, there was this family where the father fell on ill luck, lost his fortune, and he had three daughters. And basically, you had to have a dowry at that time for them to be married. And because of that, it was unlikely they would be able to be married. And so their fate was to be basically to have to enter into prostitution. So he, at a period of three nights, he threw gold bags into their house uh, that were used as the dowry for them to be married and not to have to enter into prostitution. So that's not a miraculous account, but that's where we get the stockings from, is the gold bag, because there's some stories about them uh, falling into socks or falling into shoes. That's where we get that from. But two important miracles of his is, first off, he calmed the sea on the return uh, from Jerusalem. He was going on a pilgrimage and the boat was just storm racked and the account goes that he uh, miraculously calmed the sea through the power of the Holy Spirit. And another miracle that's attributed to him is that uh, there were three children that were uh, butchered by a, by a butcher that lured him into, into a house and he uh, raised these children back to life. They were basically pickled by the uh, butcher. It was very brutal, but he I uh, prayed for them and they rose to life. Those are some of uh, the most important accounts of his miracles. There are also some accounts people have of miracles done in his name or by his, um, by his person after death as well. Those are the stories that are around with St. Nicholas that have been around throughout the years. That's so wonderful. I think that helps me to realize how amazing God is and you know mm -hmm. what kind of wonderful miracles he can perform and how amazing he can be and how things can happen for us and it just mm. that's like mm. makes you have a stronger belief you know what I'm saying yeah in my opinion so how is he tied to the Christmas holiday well he's really tied to the Christmas holiday a lot from with the with his donations to the poor and his uh, his care towards children 
because as you know, the Christmas holiday now, it's very focused on children, very focused on that. So a lot of these sort of stories about him that have entered into the myth of Santa Claus um, are, are based on stories. They're very watered down this, these days. Um, but that's a lot of his ties is sort of this goodwill, generosity, this um, goodwill towards men's spirit we have in this season. And, uh, but especially tied that he served Jesus Christ and that he, um, he stood for the faith. He stood for Jesus Christ. Um, being the Lord overall, being the Lord who died for us. That's so wonderful. I love that because, like I said, you know, Christmas holiday, it's all about, you know, the Lord and his birth. And it's good to hear more in-depth stories about it because, like, it's my first time hearing that. So I, I really enjoy that. So can you tell us about his role in the Council of Nicaea? Yeah, and just for a little bit of background, the Council of Nicaea, it was a council called by the Emperor Constantine. Basically, there's a lot of schisms within Christianity, and he wanted to decide, he wanted a council to decide what the right doctrine would be to come to the conclusion, what did the Bible teach, what did the church believe. There was a lot of conflict, and it was, he wanted peace in the empire and peace in the church. And one of the biggest issues was the identity of who Jesus Christ was. There's a group of, in, there's a group of heretics called the Arians. They followed uh, Arius, uh, a bishop in the Roman Empire. And basically, the big contention was that, is that they taught that Jesus Christ was a created being, the first created being, rather than the Son of God that's co-eternal, co-existent with the Father. So basically, as they would teach, is that Jesus was created, that he wasn't truly God, but that he had certain divine attributes. And what Orthodox Christianity would teach is that Jesus Christ is God, that he is in the same way that the Father is God, that he is God. And that was what Nicholas really stood for in the Council of Nicaea. And there's an account uh, that modern people often dispute, but it really would show the, the intensity of his devotion is that Arius was giving a speech at the Council of Nicaea and he was going on and St. Nicholas was having trouble being able to contain himself until eventually he uh, punched Arius. That's the account that he punched Arius and it resulted in him being uh, temporarily removed from being a bishop and imprisoned, but uh, that would show the strength, whether that's true or not, what we know is that St. Nicholas at the Council of Nicaea and in his ministry was very devoted to the doctrine that Jesus Christ is God. Wow, so did they have like a big brawl when he punched him? Well, there's a lot of, there's variety in the accounts with, some say that he slapped Arius, some say that he punched him, some say that it was just a different area and it wasn't Arius at all. Um, but there's a lot of different stories floating around with that. And I think it's something that we really should remember and teach in the Christmas holiday because it really adds depth to this character of St. Nicholas that we don't get today. Wow. So I just had a curiosity. How did you learn so much about this? Was it just from taking a Christian like New Testament class or mm -hmm. did you like read into this yourself or like yeah. what kind of was it? Well, I'm in church history right now, and uh, so we learned a little bit about St. Nicholas, but just from personal research, really, myself and from uh, my friends in the BMS department, uh, we really kind of like talking about these sort of things, and, you know, so it's really, it's a personal interest of mine, especially. Mm -hmm. wow. I really like that. That's awesome. So why is the divinity of Christ such a big issue, I think? Well, it's such a big issue, uh, and it's often minimized in our current climate of secularism but it's such an issue because it gets the identity of who Jesus is that our faith isn't simply just uh, having good well goodwill towards men it isn't simply just doing good works or being a good person uh, but it's that we obey a Lord who has conquered death who is truly God and truly man and it's important because we see this issue in the modern day a lot whether it's just our secular culture saying Jesus was a mere teacher or philosopher or the Mormon and the Jehovah Witness churches, they're, uh, you could class, classify them as cult movements because they, in one way or another, both deny that Jesus Christ is truly God. And the Christian doctrine is that Jesus Christ is God in the same way that the Father is God, that they're united in the Trinity with the Holy Spirit. And it's really important because if Jesus was just a man, or if he was just simply the highest created being, he could not have died for our sins. So when we remember this Christmas holiday, when we think of the baby that was born, we must remember that that baby is truly God in the flesh and that God taking on flesh is what was necessary for him to die for our sins and for us to receive forgiveness and that if he wasn't God Jesus himself claimed to be God he claimed 
I am that I am. That's a title that, uh, that's a statement that God said to uh, Moses in the Old Testament. He claimed to be God. He said, I am the Father of one. So if he wasn't God, he would be a blasphemer and he would not have raised from the dead. Our very faith, it hinges on the essence that Jesus Christ is God in the exact same way that the Father is. Absolutely. That is something yeah, everybody should think about. And, you know, because when you think about that sort of stuff, like you got to also, like you said about being forgiven for your sins by God, like I think that's amazing how, you know, Christ went through all that suffering just so we can be forgiven. And I know when I pray and ask him to forgive me for something bad I've done that I feel like, you know, I've just been like washed clean. Yeah. Like it, it's a great feeling. I don't know if like you get that same kind of I do. Yeah. feeling about that stuff. So this has been my interview with Jason Polgar. Jason, thank you so much for joining us on the journey this week. It's been so wonderful having you. And when we come back, we will be interviewing Professor Sumter and talking about Christmas and all kinds of different things. So thank you for tuning in and don't go away. Welcome back to The Journey. I'm your host for this week, Rachel Sielski. Today, I am joined with Professor Josh Sumter. So Josh, how are you today? I'm doing very well, thank you. Great. So today we're going to get to talk about the story of Jesus' birth and the most wonderful time of the year, Christmas time. But I think some kids forget about Christmas time and just only think mm -hmm. about, you know, getting gifts, but they forget the real reason for the season, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so I just want to start off with, can you give a brief overview of the story of Jesus' birth? Yeah, I, I mean, it goes way back, long before uh, Jesus is born, even probably from the beginning of the creation of the world. But um, this, this need for a Messiah, right, a, a, a longing for a Messiah. In fact, um, one who was promised a Savior uh, that would come out of the line of David, that would be a descendant of Abraham, that would be a part of the people of Israel, um, was a promised king, a promised king. And um, so we find ourselves in the first century, and this child is born to Mary and Joseph, this baby. Um, and those prophecies, the Old Testament prophecies um, about Abraham's descendancy and King David's descendancy and this, this baby that would be born to a virgin in Bethlehem, um, it comes true. Jesus fulfills those prophecies and he is the Messiah, the King um, that they've been waiting for. And so it's not just a story about a birth, or about a baby, it's the story of uh, salvation coming to the world. Absolutely, yeah. I remember once I saw uh, somebody had like a sweater and there was a picture of Jesus and it said birthday boy. And I'm like, I love that. I gotta get one of those. I'm like I should get you one of those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so neat. And I have, we have at um, home, we have a manger that's about, I think it's as old as my dad because it's oh, from wow. when he was a kid. And I just love looking at it because it's got like that old smell and everything and I feel like it's so detailed with you know showing that time and it's just like so wonderful like do you have one I, I do not have a manger um, <laughs> I think the thing that's really beautiful though it's not just the baby it's God comes in the flesh to dwell with humanity to bring salvation to the world in, in the form of babe right and yet this child grows and becomes a teacher a leader, a prophet, a king, but in a very unexpected way, um, and is ultimately crucified and is resurrected from the dead. And so it's this full story long before Jesus and long after. I think we can sometimes like kind of keep Jesus as a baby, but there's so much more going on there. Um, this king, um, in such an unexpected way, he brings his kingdom. Right. Yeah, that's such a wonderful thing. Now, what prophecies are there about the location of his birth? 
Oh, about the location. Um, if we go back to Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and I brought some notes with me, there's a pro- prophecy about Bethlehem um, being an important location um, where a king would one day come. And we see in the Gospel of Matthew, and then also in the Gospel of Luke, that Jesus is born in Bethlehem, right? He's going to be the one who fulfills a prophecy that was spoken hundreds of years before his arrival. Now, uh, do you know, I've always been curious, can you go to like Bethlehem and visit that nowadays? Oh yes, yeah, for sure. I mean, you go to Israel, you can visit Bethlehem, you can visit the Jordan, you can go to Jerusalem and uh, travel and visit those locations to see um, where they still celebrate that as the birthplace um, of Jesus. In fact, it's, it's, it's quite the tourist uh, attraction. Yeah, it's definitely a bucket list trip for me. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So what uh, prophecies are there about Mary being a virgin? Yeah, one that comes to mind, um, it obviously doesn't mention Mary. And when we go back to Isaiah, um, there are these prophetic words that are truths, their messages for their time, for their day, for their people. And Jesus happens to... Um, Obviously, they have future implications where Jesus fulfills them. But in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And we see in Luke chapter 1 um, and then in Luke chapter 2 that Mary, who was a virgin, um, which is very stunning to her husband, uh, Joseph. He's very confused. He wants to divorce her. And yet they go through. They trust that this angel that speaks to them, this messenger from God that says, Hey, you will give birth to a son. And um, that, that prophecy is fulfilled from Isaiah. And we see that in Matthew and in the Gospel of Luke as well. Now, I heard something once in Sunday school about how um, now this may be another like theory or something that Mary was 14 when she had Jesus. Mm, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't think there's biblical uh, details regarding that. But I mean, we could depict that she's probably young. Um, I mean, obviously, it's a different culture than that of Western culture where people are waiting until their late 20s, early 30s. I mean, even people two generations ago would have been having children much earlier, maybe in their very early 20s or maybe even 18, 19, 20 years old. And so it's not out of the realm of possibility, like as a teenager, um, that she definitely could have had the birth of baby Jesus. Yeah, I heard it was definitely it was something that was, you know, not it wasn't weird for women who were younger back then to have children at a young age. Yeah, for sure. I can definitely see that. So are there any other prophecies that you didn't mention previously? Yeah, I guess I just think of the genealogy. Like when you ask that question in Matthew's gospel, it opens with the lineage of Jesus. And it's not just a listing of names, but Jesus is connected with generations of people um, that are both expected and unexpected. Um, in his family tree and we see his connection to David and we see his connection to Abraham and um, God had promised Abraham that out of your family tree um, this nation will will be birthed that it will be blessed and uh, Jesus is a part of that royal lineage absolutely yes and uh, now did you learn all of this like have you been studying Christ your whole life or has this kind of like something you've learned about in college or kind of just like through readings mm. I've just been curious I mean I, I've probably heard Bible stories at a young age and probably started reading the Bible in high school and more significantly in college and um, attended graduate school not necessarily a particular emphasis on New Testament studies although I mean I'm actively reading the Bible um, but it's just continually a part of the journey to continue to learn and continue to grow and continue to understand who Jesus was and is and continues to be um, as the resurrected King. So yeah, it's, I guess, a continual journey. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Okay, yes. So why are these prophecies important? Yeah, I guess they're, they're important because Jesus is um, connected um, to a long story of the people of God, um, people that have been longing and waiting and promised that a Messiah would one day come. And um, I think it's a a reminder and it reveals that that God is faithful, that God delivers on his promises, that the um, Hebrew story, what we would call the Old Testament, comes to fruition and is fulfilled through the birth of Christ. This Messiah they've been expecting has arrived. Um, And so I think the prophecies point to that. and a people that was longing for hope, uh, they've now received it. That's so wonderful. So 
Um, another question that I'm wanting to ask you. Uh, now, your journey on becoming a minister and chaplain at the university, is this something you wanted to do when you were like really young or did you kind of come to this later in life? Or was it like, hmm. like, have you always been around faith? Yeah, I think it's a distinction between kind of calling and occupation. I think my calling is to build bridges and connect with people and point them to Christ. And that can happen through a variety of occupations. So initially, I would say in college I, in seminary, I felt called to do youth ministry, working with young people. And I still find ways to do that. Um, but the occupation has shifted to be in, in higher education and to serve college students. And the, the calling is still the same to, to um, you know, build bridges to college, with college students, to journey with them, to point them to Christ. And so sometimes the occupation and venue changes, but the calling has probably been the same. So. Mm -hmm. I can definitely say you're amazing with communicating with younger kids, like in New Testament class, like the time goes by so fast. And I'm like, I certainly, I think every other college kid would want this, have like fun real life experiences that you can relate to and I, you could laugh all day, which is what I do every time I'm in your class. So I think you're definitely amazing at doing that. <laughs> Thank you. So um, you've been attending, of course, many masses. I assume you've attended many church services. Would you, what would you say is like very special to you about attending Christmas Eve mass or if you go to mass on Christmas day? Yeah, yeah, so in my tradition, um, I attend a Presbyterian church, and so uh, we would attend that service. And I think it's important for um, those reminders, like services gathering as the church, as the body of Christ, um, especially at Christmas Eve or Holy Week, for example. Um, it serves as reminders to, of why we do what we do, why we celebrate what we celebrate, an opportunity for us to give back, an opportunity for us to share life together, an opportunity for us to worship together. And so, um, I, I just highly recommend those rhythms for people um, as part of their week, uh, whether it's Sundays or Wednesdays, but obviously um, the liturgical calendar of Advent and Holy Week and a lot of the other um, days are really important to be a part of that rhythm where we celebrate the birth of Christ, where we celebrate the death and resurrection of Christ. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Professor Sumter, for joining us this week. Um, it's been amazing having you here, and I love to hear your answers about, you know, Christ. And I love coming to you to ask questions about this sort of thing because it really helps me out with stuff. So thank you so much for joining us. Sounds good. Thank you. And when we come back, you will hear my word of encouragement for this week. So thank you so much for joining us again. And this is The Journey. Have you ever been to the Everly Library? If not, you should, because it's great. They have books of all different genres history, biography, fiction, try the evolution of life, life of Pi, or Jurassic Park. So what if books aren't your thing? Try movies like Frozen, or TV shows like Lost. Books and DVDs aren't the only thing though. Take a trip to the second floor. Welcome to the Writing Center. These tutors will tell you everything you need to know about writing a paper, and they'll help revise your essays. Now let's head back down. Behold, the Knox Learning Center need to print something out five minutes before your next class because you procrastinated, no problem. You can also print off pictures of dogs. Because, well, you can. So grab your homework, laptop, and textbook, and study diligently. Bring your lunch, too. Actually, you can't. That's illegal. Now you know the Everly Library. Stop by any time. Seriously, it's open all week. Hello and welcome back to The Journey, WCTV's only faith-based show. I'm Rachel Sielski, your host for this week. So now I thought I would give my word of encouragement. We're getting down to the end of the semester. We just have finals left. I want everybody to take time and think about ways that God has moved in their life this semester. I know for certain that when I first came to Waynesburg, I was so nervous because I didn't know what was going to happen and you know how things were going to play out. And I was even nervous to come to college first off. But, you know, I just prayed and asked God to please help me, you know, make friends and just do my best. And if I was meant to be at Waynesburg, then to please hopefully let things work out. And I think that I'm so happy that it worked out that I was definitely meant to be here. And I'm so glad that God has given me new friends and a new outlook on things. 
And that Waynesburg is so wonderful where we can attend chapel and attend upper room and have ways to express our faith in class and on campus. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And, you know, like today, I wasn't having the greatest day. And I just prayed to God. I said, could you please, you know, send someone or make me realize that I'm worthy and I can have a better day. And, you know, if you just always say a prayer, always remind yourself that God is always with you and he is always moving in your life. And all you have to do is just pray to him because he will always hear you. And I just think back to, you know, times in my life that had been rough and I've kind of fallen off a little bit. And I think that it's because I wasn't recognizing God in my life and I forgot to, you know, say a prayer and things were going so bad. And I think that if everyone could find Christ, of course, this world would be a better place. But you just have to remember that when you're dealing with bad times, those mistakes help you do better for the future. And I read a quote one somewhere that said, you know, we don't have just straight up bad days. We have great days and days that give us lessons, which are our bad days. And I'm actually thankful for all the mistakes I've made in my life because they've given me uh, a new perspective and they've helped me be wiser in making decisions in the future. So sometimes you have to sit back and think like, you'll think, oh man, I'm so stupid, why did I do this? But then you gotta remind yourself that this happened because God wanted you to see that it wasn't right for you or it was, and you had to be more you know, intelligent for the future and learn what to do next. And that's what I love about you know, the whole thing. And I've been starting a new thing where I've been reading a daily devotion from a book called Jesus Calling, and I highly recommend it to anybody who wants to just put God in their life each day. And I read one every day, and in each one of them, it includes, of course, uh, verses from the Bible. And they tell you, you know, to just be thankful to God and remember that he's always with you. And like I was saying earlier, all you have to do is just pray. And especially when you go to church, whether you go to church bi-weekly or just monthly or you don't go that often, you know, it's not, God's not going to love you any less because, you know, you don't go to church so much. If you pray and believe in him and you just try to be the best person you can be, then he's still going to love you no matter what. And even if you aren't making the best decisions, uh, pray to him and ask God to forgive you for what you've done. Or if you're like in a tough spot, all you have to do is just ask him to help you out. And I think things will go better for anybody because, you know, God's amazing and he's moved in gracious ways in my life. And I'm so thankful to him for everything he's done for me. And, you know, of course, I hope he's not finished yet because a lot of things are still going on. And just always remember that you have everything you need in him. And if you get down on yourself and you think, well, man, I don't have any friends or this person left me or, you know, my grades are falling, always remember that all you have to do is just say a prayer and God will help you out no matter what. He'll send someone along or he'll make things happen. And I remember a quote once that the Lord said, he goes, when the time is right, I, the Lord, will make it happen. And I truly believe that because, you know, I think to myself, like I see people these days getting engaged or something happened and I think, well, man, I've never been with someone and I get so upset. But then I just pray to God that I know when the timing is right, he'll send me the right person. And all I have to do is just keep praying. And I trust that, you know, when it's his timing and when he wants me to find someone, he will make it happen. And so I just think about that. I think about things and I think like you have to love yourself first before another person can love you. And that's something I struggle with sometimes and that I'm praying that I hope gets better with by time. And, you know, I love the Lord so much and I just continue to always pray and say, you know, when the right person comes along, I know I'll know, and I know you'll send them along. And I constantly pray all the time because like, all I have to do is pray and know that God is amazing and he will always be there for me no matter what. So thank you so much for listening to my word of encouragement. Best of luck on your finals and don't forget to always pray. Thank you for joining us on the journey. This has been a production of Waynesburg Community Television.